you got to be able to try small bets for a while small bets and find out is can it be successful and do you really believe in it the small bets aren't just to find out if something's going to work it's finding out do you believe in what you're doing so for an entrepreneur try things out and do you believe in it are you able to deal with it when you don't get that immediate res result you know everyone wants everyone wants progress and recognition but if you're not having progress and not having recognition do you still care about it i think that's the key yeah, you know, that's a great point. I think so many people think it's always about them. Everyone's in their own bubble. You know, they're thinking about what they got to do that given day, what they got to do at the end of the day. It's, it's about them anyways. So you think like, oh, wow, what are they going to think? What are they going to think about me? No, what do you think about yourself? You know, do you feel pride in what you're doing? Are you loving what you're doing? Because if you're not, it doesn't matter. Good morning, Savannah. This is Therese with the Savannah Business Showcase, and I'm here this morning with a very, very special guest, uh, Jesse Cole, the owner of the Savannah Bananas and the Gastonia Grizzlies, correct? You got it. Um, and he's also the host of Find, the Find Your Yellow Tux podcast. You got that right. right. So we have him in the studio, and I'm very excited about this. Uh, so, um, Jesse, the way I like to start is I start with the scenario, right? So... Uh, here's the scenario because the purpose of the show is to motivate entrepreneurs motivate uh, local residents let them know who who they're living around who the business owners let's around. do so, it I'm ready for the scenario okay all right um, you're walking through your neighborhood a little kid comes up to you and they say Jesse you're my hero I want to be like you when I grow up um, in a language that a 10 or 12 year old can understand what does it take to be Jesse Cole <laughs> oh I like it what does it take <laughs> so I'm telling this 10 or 12 year old what it's like to be me yeah what, what does it take uh, yeah, I think more than anything, you know, you got to live life, you know, for me, you got to live life having fun. You got to live life having, you know, be excited. And I mean, for me, everything, I wear a bright yellow tux. I know you can't see it on the radio, um, but I think a lot of times people try to be someone for someone else. So I tell this 10 year old, I said, be you, yeah. have fun, man, live life and enjoy it. And whatever you can do, whatever you love the most, keep doing it and you mm. be the best at it. Mm. And I think that's so key for everyone. They try to do other things that they might not be the best at. Mm -hmm. So I tell the kid, hey, if you're a 10 year old and you absolutely love whatever it is, even now if it's video games, if you love it, be the best video game player in the world. And mm. now there's actually sports with video games. Yeah. So I'll tell the kid and do what you do, do what you love and enjoy it, my friend. Awesome. Awesome. Okay, so real quick, like, tell the people about you. Where, where are you from? How did you end up in Savannah? <laughs> I originally from Massachusetts, uh, and I was fortunate to get a college baseball scholarship, so I went down to Wofford College, which was the second smallest Division One school in the country. Okay. Uh, 1,100 students, but I a uh, great opportunity to go down there. I was fortunate to get a scholarship, and everything was going well. The goal was to play professional baseball, and then all of a sudden, my junior year, I was talking to teams, the, the Mets, the Pirates, everything was going to turn out great, mm -hmm. and then I tore everything in my shoulder. Mm -hmm. I mean everything. Mm -hmm. And and uh, I got surgery from Dr. Andrews in Birmingham, Alabama, but nothing came back. And then all of a sudden, my playing career was over. So at that point, I'm sitting there, a senior in college, not sure what I'm going to do. I had an opportunity to go in coaching, and I went into coaching a little bit, and then it wasn't for me. Mm -hmm. So I got an email about an internship about a from a college summer baseball team in Spartanburg. They don't even exist anymore. <laughs> they were the worst team in the country, and I mean like 100 people coming to the games. Wow. But I said, you know what, let's try it. Show up that first day, they hand me a phone book, and they said, make sponsorship calls, try to sell some tickets. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, I enjoyed it. I actually loved getting out in the community, and I got offered the job as a general manager of the team in Gastonia, North Carolina. And this was back in 2007. They gave a job right kid right out of college to be the GM of a team and I came in there and you know that's where the job started and that's where really my passion grew into something completely different than playing baseball yeah. but actually creating a circus with our teams and that's what we've done yeah awesome awesome okay uh, you might not know this but like Savannah and Boston used to be sister cities did you know that never knew that yeah yeah they used to, uh, even up until like the Civil War like Boston was sending supplies to Savannah oh wow yeah yeah that's crazy Random fact. I love that. We need those. We need more random facts today. <laughs> so when was the moment? So I'm, I'm sitting here, uh, everybody out there listening, a crossover guy, the yellow suit, the yellow tux, and I I didn't, I knew he was going to have the yellow tux. I didn't know what to wear. I didn't know whether to dress up or dress down. Uh, so um, There's usually so, confusion on how for people yeah, to dress around me. They yeah, don't know what to do, so yeah. I, I'm understanding. But that's cool for you because you can go anywhere, <laughs> I right? I have six of these yellow tuxedos, <laughs> so I wear them everywhere, yes. <laughs> so when was the moment that you said um, – I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. I'm going to wear this tux for the rest of my life. All right. So long story short, we came into Gastonia and 
found out the numbers were really challenging. So, I mean, the team was struggling, and we really had to make it about entertainment. We had to make it about a show to save the team. And I could tell you some crazy stories about how bad it was in Gastonia. Yeah. But we tried everything. Flatulence, fun night, salute to <laughs> underwear night. We tried it all. And uh, some worked, some didn't work. But the reality is the 2011 season, I said, if we're putting on a show, if our players are doing choreographed dances during the games, we're having grandma beauty pageants, if it's a circus, we got to dress like it's a show. Mm -hmm. So I got a black tuxedo. One of my friends actually owned a bridal and formal shop, so I need a black tuxedo, similar to P.T. Barnum. I got a picture here in my office, you yeah. know, showmanship. I said, I got to get a big one with the tails, and I got it opening night. It's 100 degrees, and I'm in this black <laughs> tuxedo. I'm like, I'm burning up. I mean, it's crazy. <laughs> it's the humidity, too. Oh, it's, oh, it's, it's brutal. Yeah. I sweated through the whole tuxedo. You know, people are like, what is wrong with you? So I went online. I was like, can I find something, you know, a little bit, you know, lighter, a little bit better? And then I, the Grizzlies also had yellow in their color. It was black and yellow. So mm -hmm. I was like, maybe yellow. I was like, there's got to be a yellow tuxedo somewhere. So I searched and found brightcoloredtuxedos.com. It actually <laughs> exists. And I found it and uh, I ordered it right then and shipped it there before the next game. And it was a yellow tuxedo. And that first game, first day I wore it, everyone was coming over and taking pictures. And was like, Jesse, that fits you. My staff knew where I was at all times. Yeah. Fa yeah. Fans knew where I was. And uh, at that point, that yellow tuxedo stuck. And it's a point now where people actually call the office and say, can we get the yellow tuxedo guy to come over? Like, I don't even, it's not even a name. It's the yellow tuxedo <laughs> guy. Um, I proposed in my yellow tuxedo to my wife in awesome. front of a sold out crowd in Gastonia. Amazing. Thank goodness she said yes. I mean, it's a guy in a yellow tuxedo. But uh, it's become a big part of my life. And I guess it's my calling card. Yeah. But but my, my thought and my belief is that everyone has their own yellow tux. They have one thing that makes them stand out. And that's the best version of themselves. And this yellow tux represents me. It's being crazy, being fun, being outgoing, mm -hmm. and really putting myself out there. And I believe everyone has that. And that's where the podcast and that's where the book has come from, Find Your Yellow Tux. So how do you suggest people find that? <laughs> you know, because we we all, you know, are trying to be someone else nine times out of ten, you know? Yeah. We're all trying to live a story that somebody else gives us. Well, it's a great question. I think the book really lays out a foundation of that. Okay. I, I think, for and not just for people, but for businesses, I think they need to start with that fundamental question, what frustrates you about the business and what frustrates frustrates you about your life right now. Mm. And it's a such, a, I hate negativity, mm -hmm. but you have to start there. And you think all great businesses started like that. I mean, you think about Uber and Lyft. I mean, right. people didn't like the cab industry. You think about Netflix. I mean, Blockbuster was terrible. You got terrible. late fees. It was a terrible oh, experience. Yeah. And that's how businesses start. The great businesses start what frustrates you. So if you think about yourself, take a different level. In your given day, what are certain things that are frustrating and bothering you? And then you need to think back, why are you doing this? Mm -hmm. And what are the things during the day that you absolutely love, that you get fired up about mm -hmm. and do more of that? What, what can you be the best at? And so those are the questions I think about in a given day. What's firing me up? What's excited? Like this right now that we're connecting? Yeah. I love this. I would yeah. do this all day yeah. because it's sharing passion. Right. And so that's what I need to do more. And that's why we do videos and media and audio and when I'm performing in front of 4,000 fans. But mm -hmm. I'll tell you right now, me doing operations and trying to put up signs and zip, uh, zip ties <laughs> and everything, I'm terrible at it and I'm not doing it. Yeah. So people should look at what they're doing during a given day and are they doing more firefighting or putting out things that they don't want to be doing mm -hmm. versus what are they doing really well at? It sounds simple, but find what you do really well and it, be the best at it, and there will always be a job for you. Mm. And that's how you get to what that, that calling card is, what that find you all tucks. I mean, right now you're talking to me, I know you love this. Yeah. You become the best at this, you'll never have to wor worry about working again. Right. That's what I believe. Right. Awesome. All right, so step back. How did you end up in Savannah? <laughs> Savannah. All right, so back when I was saying I proposed to my wife, it was yeah. a sold-out crowd in 2014, and uh, got down to a knee in the yellow tuxedo. Uh, she said yes and had fireworks go off. We stopped the game, so the umpire was like, are you guys ever going to play again? And I was like, we'll get to it. And finally... Uh, the next day, she was like, hey, you did this for me. I'd love to surprise you. We always talked about going to Savannah. Let's go check it out. Okay. So she surprised me with a trip to Savannah that weekend. We came down, and we fell in love with the area, fell in love with the community. We went to a game at the Grayson Stadium. The former team was playing there. We don't like to say their name, but we were there, their <laughs> former team. And we went up in, in the grandstand. And there was only about 500 people there. It mm. was a beautiful night, 80 degrees, and it was just a baseball game. And there was no excitement. And we were looking at this majestic stadium, the you know, the history behind the stadium. Mm -hmm. We were like, wow, this would be amazing. That night, I texted the commissioner of the league, our league. I said, hey, if this team ever leaves Savannah, I go, we're coming here because there's a great opportunity. Lo and behold, the team ended up, didn't get the new stadium. They went to Columbia, South Carolina, and uh, we reached out to the city. And I'll never forget, October 5th, we moved into the stadium. And 
the former team had cut the phone lines, they cut the internet lines, oh, man. and everything was taken out. We worked on a picnic table that day on October 5th, yeah. and my wife and I were getting married on October 10th. So we got the <laughs> keys to the stadium, we were getting married, and we came in here, and really a blank slate. It was yeah. an opportunity to start over. And there were some serious challenges and adversity we came, you know, in the next six months. But once we finally came out with the name and the excitement of what we're trying to do, fortunately it took off. But yeah. it was a lot of challenges before yeah. that. I can only imagine. And, and I've listened to the podcast, so yes. I've heard some you, of the You know the challenges, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's crazy. So, so I'm, I'm assuming, like, I know myself and I, I can feel the same energy as you. Like, mm-hmm. you would be successful anywhere you lived. You know, so, like, why stay in Savannah? Oh, geez. Well, I think the, the great thing about Savannah, it's got so much – Character is the easy way to answer. That's the hack answer. It's got character. It's unique. It's creative. It is. Yeah. But it's just fun. You know, if you can keep it very simple, if you go to our websites, we make baseball fun. That's what we try to do, everything. Yeah. It's a fun town. Yeah. You know, people don't take themselves too seriously here. It's not not everyone's dressed up in full suits. I mean, I'm wearing a suit, but it's yellow. You know, mm-hmm. it's ridiculous. The reality is people can let loose. They can be themselves, and it just fits. And mm-hmm. when we put a circus out there and have our s- senior citizen dance team, the Banana Nanas, dancing, <laughs> and when we give away a porta john during the game or give away a colon cleansing, people yeah. are like, yeah, let's do this, <laughs> you know? And I think that's what makes Savannah such a great area area is that people can just have fun let loose and be themselves and i can't see ourselves leaving savannah just because of the entire environment and community here yeah yeah, yeah I, I agree with that wholeheartedly it's, yeah. i mean it's like one of the only places you can drink and walk around it, you know what i'm saying it's normal it's like when you go to lunch like you want a beer and it's like what like, it's like that's, that's <laughs> right. normal in yeah. savannah it, it, it's yeah. crazy but you know what it's that's the way you should live life you i know, think so too you know, yeah. it's you know normal and professional i am so against you know i always mm-hmm. say whatever's normal do the exact opposite mm-hmm. and you know we don't need more professionalism we need more fun mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so that's a good quote whatever's normal do the exact opposite when did you first like make that a part of your life uh you know i think first impressions are so important and i i remember when i first joined gastonia and that first day and i saw the struggles but when i went to a conference in my first month there i was like Mm -hmm. i gotta learn everything i don't know what i'm doing Mm -hmm. i have no idea and there was an amazing speaker al fadden and he wrote the book innovation on demand and he opened he opened his book he's running around throwing two dollar bills and he's like what's so great about two dollar bills and if you got the answer right, if you said memorable, it's different. He would just shower you with $2 bills. I was like, I, I love this guy. And he gets on stage and he goes, I want to tell you about my book. And I was like, oh, he's going into book spiel. But he gave a great lesson. He said, this book, Innovation on Demand, you know how I sold it? Here's what I did. I bought an entire retail space, a whole storefront in Minneapolis. Mm-hmm. And I set up a bookstore. The only thing, I was only selling my book. One <laughs> book. It was a one book bookstore. So he literally set it up and he had his books in different sections like business and yeah. history and self-help. He put it all over and he had a sign that said shoplifting's encouraged because he actually wanted people to have his book. Right. He would do anything. And what happened was he created so much attention that all of a sudden People Magazine put a special on him. National media was covering it. And again, whatever's normal, do the exact opposite. The normal thing, try to get your book in a bookstore. Yeah. The exact opposite, set up your own bookstore with only one book. <laughs> <laughs> and from that point on, I thought, I That's thought, brilliant. you know what? Everything we do, whatever's normal, do the exact opposite. Mm-hmm. You know, beer fest. For instance, this last year, a beer festival. Everyone, they're now popular. Now everyone does them. They, you know, so they do them at night. They do them, you know, whatever in the evening, afternoon. So right. we said, let's do our first ever morning beer festival. So okay. we started the beer festival. At, it called it Tap of the Morning Beer Festival. Started at 9 a.m. because yeah. you can't drink all day if you don't start you in the start morning. The morning yeah. So we had a beer fest at night. But you know what? What happened? People were talking about it. And at 8:30, there's a line of 100 plus people to come start drinking. <laughs> <laughs> Again, another reason why I love Savannah. But but the reality is that's what gets people excited. Yeah. You know, what would have been normal to name the team the Seagulls or the Spirits or the Ghosts or whatever. That would have been maybe normal. Right. Naming the team after a fruit was not normal. We're the only team named <laughs> right. a fruit. But what happened, that created excitement. Mm-hmm. And I think everyone should live their life that way. Yeah. Yeah. I think everyone wants to live their life. That's why they're so attracted to the Savannah Bananas because they want to live a life that way. Yeah. Just yeah. having fun. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome, man. Okay. All right, so uh, tell me about the name. Tell me about Savannah Bananas. How did that come? Well, just like we, we had to help us name the team contest, we got about a thousand suggestions. Okay. All right. And tons of like people were like, you know, Cardinals, Braves. They were naming all the former teams. And I was like, look at this. And then one night, the first night, we had one suggestion yeah. from a woman named Lynn Moses and was Bananas. And we all looked at each other like, wow, yes. <laughs> and, and the reality is what was so great about it is we talked to her later and she's like, well, when you said you want something unique, crazy, and different, I was like, well, this is kind of crazy, unique, and different. So we sat as a staff and we said, what can we do with this? Mm-hmm. And we started thinking, you know, we can name our mascot Split. You know, the idea of Go Bananas, the senior citizen dance team called the Banana Nanas, a promotion, Banana in the Pants. You know, we could have a banana <laughs> beer. And we thought about yeah. all this. It's like, wow, this could really build a fun brand. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, something like Seagulls couldn't do that. 
Something like ports couldn't do that. And so we said, we're going to do this, and we know we're going to be criticized. We know it's going to be. I make the joke all the time now when I get invited to speak at, uh, anywhere. I always say, wow, glad to be here. When we first came out with the name, no one invited me anywhere. Because the reality <laughs> is when we first came out with the bananas, no one wanted to talk to us right. because they're like, who are you guys? But then all of a sudden, it created the excitement. They're like, I get it. Mm -hmm. These guys are fun. It's different. It's entertainment. It's not baseball. And so we thought it was the perfect fit, and it's really taken off. I mean, yeah. it, it sold the uh, merchandise to 44 states in the first few hours. It was number one trending on Twitter. It got a tremendous amount of attention, which was great because before then, no one was paying attention to us at all, even though we were like, hey, we are different. This is what we're doing. Right. It was the name that kind of jump-started that. Gotcha. And so I think whenever any business does a launch, they should think about what are they doing that's different that's going to create excitement. Mm -hmm. If they're doing what everyone else is doing, no one cares. No one cares. You're that's right. The, that's the key. You're right. Absolutely right. But I just had this uh, banana beer recently. <laughs> yeah. You know, so it's pretty good. Yeah. You know, you know it's funny. Uh, Service Brewing Company did an amazing job. And yeah. they made this great drinkable beer. They made it with 360 pounds of bananas, <laughs> and, and w which is interesting. You know, it's one of those. I'm more of a uh, stronger. I'm an IPA kind of guy. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they, they, they made a beer that was good for the summer. And, you know, yeah. we're excited to work with them. And they do great stuff. So uh, we'll see. We're probably going to roll the dice and try some new things this okay, year. Okay. Cool, right, we're going to cool, keep cool, it going. Cool. I'm looking forward to it. Um, so what was I gonna ask? Oh, so uh, the bananas aren't—they're not minor league. No, okay. See, that's the big thing. That, yeah. that, that's what's really cool about the story. And in Gastonia, North Carolina, the first team—they had a minor league team there, mm -hmm. the Gastonia Rangers, and they had you know Sammy Sosa, Pudge Rodriguez, oh, wow. Juan Gonzalez. All these guys played there, and they only averaged about 600, 700 fans a game. Wow, they left okay. because they couldn't be successful at that old ballpark. And then here, there was minor league baseball, professional baseball, since the 1930s. I mean, mm -hmm. literally, there's never been um, an amateur team played here. Hmm. And what that showed to me is that in Gastonia, the minor league professional team with great players had to leave because they couldn't be successful. Here, after 90 years, professional baseball had to leave because it couldn't be successful. It mm -hmm. wasn't sustainable. Mm -hmm. What that proved to us is that baseball wasn't working in the mm. scheme of baseball. And it had to be about entertainment, excitement, and fun. Mm -hmm. And if we tried to promote baseball, that's what I learned in Gastonia, we'd be the same as everyone else. And so you got to know, it's not what business you're in, but it's what business are you really in. Mm -hmm. And I think everyone needs to understand that and think about that. Because if you think you're just doing the main thing that everyone else is, you're in trouble. Yeah. And we realized we were in the entertainment business. We were about creating a circus and creating fun. If you ask the 4,000 fans that come every single night here, it's about having fun and it's about socializing. It is not about, did that guy hit a 3-2 curveball in the sixth inning? Mm -hmm. All right? Mm -hmm. It's not about that. And what happens is it's great. The baseball turns out outstanding because the players love playing in front of a sold-out crowd every night. Mm -hmm. And they rise up and play better. So it makes the baseball better. But you yeah. have to make the experience better for the fans and customers first mm -hmm. to make that better. Chicken and egg. It, you, got, you got that yeah, right. Got you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the podcast real quick. Yeah. Uh, so what, what have you learned? So t tell me about the podcast and then tell me what you learned from some of the interviews you've done. Sure. So, you know, launching Find Your Yellow Tux, like I said, the, the big challenge and the big problem and why I launched this, I'll never forget it was an aha moment. And I was driving in, to, this was in Gastonia up in Charlotte with our other team. And I'm coming from Charlotte. I, was li I had a house in Charlotte. It was about three or four years ago. And I'm driving in, and all of a sudden, I see bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic going the other way into Charlotte from Gastonia. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I'm looking at this, and I notice it all the time, but it was this moment I was like, these people do that every single day, it's terrible. every yeah. day, and they're stuck in traffic, bumper to bumper, and they're working the nine to five. Mm -hmm. Whereas I am so fortunate, I'm driving the other way against traffic with just getting going to work at a ballpark yeah. at any time I want to go and any time I want to leave. Yeah. And I realized that that's a serious problem, that people are stuck that they feel stale in what they're doing and they don't have that, they aren't able to create their own path. Mm -hmm. And so when I realized with what we're doing here is that we're creating something that's special, different and unique. And I believe everyone has that opportunity. Mm -hmm. And find your yellow tux, as I've said before, it's it's the one thing that makes you stand out. It's the best version of yourself and everyone should be living that. So with the goal of the podcast and the goal of the book, especially with the podcast at first, is to interview people that are standing out, that are doing things unique, different. They're living their life. They're creating their own path. And uh, it's been a fun journey. You know, mm -hmm. with anything, just starting out, it's always a challenge. Yeah. You know, you're trying to get people excited to be a part of it. But the reality is uh, I've learned so much. And I think that's one of the best things about podcasts. And they're taking off now. But oh, anyone, yeah. the opportunity to speak with people and learn from them, there's nothing more valuable. I talk about this, I think, the second chapter in my book. It's be a sponge. Mm -hmm. You know, take everything in because it'll only help you get better. And that's been one of the great things for me with this podcast is I'm able to learn from it. And I've already, in, in, I know our listeners are going to be able to learn from it as well and take little nuggets and say, you know what, I'm going to put that into my life and make my life better and make myself, you know, stand out. I don't feel stuck anymore. I don't feel stale with my job. Find something that fires me up every day. Mm -hmm. And that's the goal of the podcast. 
Awesome. Awesome. What, so what, what are some of the things you've learned from your interview guests? <laughs> you know, it's, it's really interesting. The one thing, and I think, you know, a great analogy is you're playing baseball as a kid and your father is always telling you, make sure you stay back, make sure you stay back. And you don't listen to him. And then all of a sudden a co <laughs> coach says to you, hey, make sure you stay back on that. Stay back on that. Keep that elbow up or yeah. whatever. And all of a sudden you listen to your coach. Yeah. The reality is it's a lot of things that I know and I believe in. You know, for instance, about, you know, be you. Don't try to be someone else. You know, be true to yourself. You know, the key to all that. But it's everyone else is saying it. Mm -hmm. So everyone I'm interviewing, they're saying it in different ways. It's like, you know, I had to find the thing that was for me. And the more you hear it from other people, the more it kind of engraves into your skull that mm -hmm. this is the way it needs to be. So um, I've had some great guests coming up. Uh, you know, I've listened to, uh, I just interviewed Tim Connor, who, you know, has written 81 books. Wow. He's given 4,500 speeches and presentations in 25 countries. Wow. And I sat down with him for over an hour. And it's amazing. His first book, Soft Cell, sold over 1.5 million copies. And to see someone that literally, for me afterwards, he's asking questions to me. He's trying to learn. And he's in his 60s or 70s. I'm not sure, but he's much older. Mm -hmm. And he's constantly just learning and trying to get better. Mm. That's really a sign of true greatness. Mm -hmm. It's you always got to try to improve. What are you doing today to get better tomorrow? Mm -hmm. And I say this all the time. You know, you need to be comfortable being uncomfortable. And that was a great point to me. I was asked a question in another interview yesterday. It's like, what are you doing today to be uncomfortable? Right. And I go, every single day, I'm trying to reach out to people and put myself out there. And this Yellow Talks, the podcast, that is, I'm not used to this. I'm used to being in front of 4,000 fans in a stadium, but I'm not used to throwing myself out there and trying to ask people for more advice and put it out to our listeners. Mm -hmm. If you continue to do that, you're going to be better tomorrow than you were the day before. Mm -hmm. And if you look back in a year, you know, I think Ronald Reagan said it. He said, are you better off? now than you were four years ago. And that won the election versus Jimmy Carter. Mm. And I think everyone should ask that question at the end of the year. Are you better off because of things you did or are you the same person? Mm -hmm. And I think that's the key. And that's what this podcast and, and book and everything has helped. Awesome. Yeah, that's that's kind of a trend. You mentioned that he was uh, still asking you questions. The uh, what did you say his name was? Yeah, Tim, Tim Connor. Tim Connor. Yeah, and that's that's a trend I've noticed in some of the uh, more successful entrepreneurs I've interviewed and, yeah. and just listening to you yeah. on your podcast that you ask questions. You ask great questions, yeah. and that's kind of the key to being a successful entrepreneur, successful successful in anything. You do. Yeah, it's you once know? once you stop asking questions, you're done. Right. And and you look at that. So if you're if you're a business leader and you own, and you own a business, you know, are your people asking questions? Are you mm -hmm. asking questions? Questions of them you know when you have people and there are certain people that always rise up they keep coming to you and asking more questions those are gonna be the leaders mm -hmm. because they care so much to get better the other ones you got to teach that you got to engrave that I mean you can see right here we've got our bookshelf here yeah. we actually have a better book club in our in our business awesome. so actually everyone and we pay our employees to read nice so we actually they read 25 50 75 100 bucks for the read because you got to keep teaching that culture of learning and getting better mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. continuous improvement right if you're not improving you're dying if you're not growing you're dying yep. exactly yep. exactly yeah Okay. I right, also awesome. um well we got a few more minutes. Uh what's your favorite book? <laughs> no, no. You know, it's funny. I asked that question on my podcast. It's, yeah. it's like asking uh, someone what their favorite child is. <laughs> you, you know, it's, I know which one mine is. Uh, no, I was just joking. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think the big thing, and I'll answer this question, try not to do it politically. I think with books, you, you find themes in your life that you're going on. So like culture is a big thing that I'm studying right now as I'm building a business. Marketing was a big thing that I was doing earlier. Um, but, you know, the one book that I think really says a lot, and I've always been inspired by it is John Gordon's uh, The Carpenter and it's it's a John Gordon's a unbelievably motivational speaker but he basically says the three most important things are love serve and care and he said if you do this in your life you're going to have more success than you ever had and you'll be able to really actually have purpose uh, it's very difficult for me not to say Simon Sinek because I've been so motivated by Simon Sinek and his mm -hmm. TED talk how great leaders inspire action yeah. and his books fine I, I just, I just found him he's amazing he's brilliant uh, I actually got a funny story about Simon if you want to hear it yeah uh, so I, I started in 2016, the thank you experiment. And this was actually came from John Gordon as well. Okay. And basically what John Gordon said in his book, uh, he wrote it called The One Word. And the one word basically says, instead of New Year's resolutions, what's 87% of New Year's resolutions fail every year, pick one word that you focus on for the year. Just one word. Keep it in front of you every day and think about that word. And I started trying it with my family. And I said, you know, I told Emily, my wife, I said, my word's going to be care. But I don't want to just think about caring every day. I want to have something tangible that shows that I care. So I was like, you know, I'm going to write a thank you letter every single day. Mm. I'm going to start the day with gratitude. So I started every morning. I started getting my list. And I write my thank you letter. You can see here, I'm still doing it today. Yeah. And I sent it out. And probably like one of my first ones was Simon Sinek, probably mm. in the first month because his his uh, TED talk just changed my life. Mm. So I sent it to him and didn't expect anything. Obviously you sent all these things. All of a sudden I'm driving to work about two months later and I see an unknown phone number come up 
and I answered the phone and I said, hello, this is Jesse. Jesse, this is Simon Sinek here. And I go, <laughs> shut up, who is this? And, and, and he goes, it's Simon Sinek. I go, come on, who is this? Because everyone knows Simon's had right. an influence. And he goes, I'm calling to thank you for your letter. And I go, wow, this is really Simon. He goes, yes. He goes, your letter truly inspired me. And I go, Simon, you've inspired me more. And he goes, but your letter and your inspiration is what inspires me every day. Mm. If I can inspire people to make a difference, that's what keeps me going. And I didn't want to get him off the phone. I, right. tried, I took everything I could of those two minutes. But, but the, the reality is, you know, he understands his purpose stronger than anyone else. And he should because he's teaching it. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, boy, that's still driving him. For some one person to send him a thank you letter, he yeah. calls to let him know how much of an impact that had on him. Yeah. You know, that's, that's amazing. It's unbelievable. I actually did the same thing, but it was with a guy back in, it was like 2013, 2012. Anyway, with a guy, uh, Reza Pai is the Art of Man. Okay, he, excellent. I, I wrote him a thank you letter, and he sent me the sticker back. And I, I was surprised to even get a response back, too. Because you, th you think of people that, that they sit on a pedestal yep. and you can never reach them. Yep. But the reality is that the people at the top want to help you more. 100%. Because they, because they constantly think about giving. Right. You know, that's that's their thing. You know, they're, it's not about themselves. Mm -hmm. So the most successful people want to give back, give back, give back more. Right. That's why it's really interesting. So many people are so afraid to ask. I'll tell you right now, if someone shoots me an email or asks, hey, can, can you help me with something? Can you help me? I want to do that mm -hmm. because I know it also helps me. The more you can go through and talk those things. But the reality is you got to continue to help people. Right. And, and, you know, Tim Connor and Simon Sinek, that's all they're focused on is giving back. Mm -hmm. Whereas a lot of people, as they're still growing, they're focused on themselves. That's amazing. It's That's different. amazing. Yeah. 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 I, I knew it was a 50-50 chance you'd even respond to my email, so I just figured I'd try. <laughs> <laughs> well, I responded, right? I mean, yeah, I, you I, did, without a doubt. Yeah. B because the reality is, I, I enjoy that stuff because if you can give back a little bit, whoever listens to, and you know, I think a lot of people have podcasts, well, how many downloads do you have all this? Well, mm -hmm. the reality is whether it's one person, and I hate that yeah. that's so cliche if you can impact one because you got to value your time, mm -hmm. but you never know what that one person can do with the advice that you give them. Very true. Or, or they can help you. Yeah. You know, I think that that's it. Every time I'm learning from people, I'll learn as much from this this talk right now as hopefully you, the listeners uh, can take mm. up a few nuggets. So. Mm. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So how how do uh, I ask this one more question and we'll go for a break. Okay. Uh, so how do you incorporate giving back with the bananas? Like what do the bananas do to give back? Well, it's understanding what, what the purpose of the business is. So I think the biggest reality is most businesses have these long mission statements that not even their employees know what they are. <laughs> right, right. You know, they, and, and we simplified it a few years ago. And it was fans first, entertain always. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. Now, it's not necessarily why we do. I'll get to that a little bit, but it's what we do. Mm -hmm. So if everything we do, we focus on giving back to the fans, making it the best fan experience, all right, and then entertaining them, they will get something out of that that'll really make a difference in their lives. Mm. The best moment of my game, every game that I go to, is at the end of the game when our staff and I are at the gates thanking the fans. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden what's happening, we're getting hugs, they're taking selfies, they're saying it's the best time they've had. To me, they're leaving going home and they're happier and they're in a better spot. And if that makes a difference in their life, in their work, whatever, we've been able to do what we do. Mm -hmm. And so that's where we go to why. It's the difference that we make in people's lives. And we believe we can bring people together and treat them like this awesome, fun family yeah. that's in, they're like inside the joke of what's going on, <laughs> but then they're leaving and they're going home and it's like, wow, that was awesome. Yeah. And that's why we can try to continue that year round and put out fun videos and put out different events in the off season so people can still have that feeling. Mm -hmm. And that drives us. And it's, if you ask anyone on our staff, fans first, entertain always, that's what we do. And mm -hmm. so we've been able to simplify that. And I, we still got a long ways to go. I, I don't have all the answers, yeah. but we're still learning, but that's one of the keys for us. Right. And that, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, they say that the, the two things that uh, drive people to take action is uh, what pleasure and pain. Mm -hmm. It's only those two things. And pleasure, you can tell when, when people come to your games that it's pleasure they're seeking. Mm -hmm. And that's why people come. That's why they give you hugs. That's why they take selfies yeah. because you're giving them so much, yeah. so much joy. And I'll take, so it, I get that. I'll take it a step further. I, and I still feel, I feel pain when people don't feel that. Mm. So that's, you know, and that may be ego. That may be whatever. But if I feel like people, there's not many people coming or people aren't excited or it's a bad experience, that hurts me in my core. Mm -hmm. So there's a difference. It's that fear that I have of people not having that feeling that mm. pushes me to give even more of that feeling. Mm -hmm. So I think it goes both ways. Mm. Brilliant. Okay. All right. Well, we'll take a quick break, right. <laughs> <laughs> everybody. Uh, so how, how can people find you, reach you, talk to you real quick before we go to a break? Yeah. Uh, find your Yellow Tux uh, website or just Jesse Cole, Yellow Tux guy. I'm on Facebook posting things every day. So uh, find your Yellow Tux is the best way. Search that. You'll, you're not going to find any other people wearing the Yellow Tux. So you search <laughs> find your Yellow Tux, you'll find us. <laughs> I right, also awesome. so thank you guys for listening. We'll be right back in just a second. Don't go anywhere. And I'm gonna put Jesse through the lightning round. So we'll be back in just a second. Hang on. All right, Savannah, welcome back to the Savannah Business Showcase. I'm here once again with Jesse Cole of the Savannah Bananas and of 
Find Your Yellow Tux podcast. Uh, we are going to put him through the lightning round. Are you ready? Let's do it. All right. Uh, what did you want to be a kid, and how does it relate to your current business? What did I want to be as a kid? A hundred percent. I was going to play baseball for the Red Sox. Growing up in Boston, that was it for me. Going to play baseball for the Red Sox. I was fortunate to be a bat boy when I was a kid. Okay. And uh, actually at Fenway Park. Nice. And then I got to pitch at Fenway in 2005. But that was as close as I ever got to pitch it for the Red Sox after I tore everything in my shoulder. <laughs> so how did that affect me as a kid? You know, it was the constant drive. You know, you think about things as a kid. I practiced every single day. My father bought a baseball facility up in Massachusetts. Nice. Okay. And literally, I would go to the batting cages because it was cold, and I would hit every single day and it was then I realized more than now it's about the journey as a 12 year old kid I couldn't play in the major leagues as a 14 year old kid I couldn't play in the major leagues you know right now everybody entrepreneurs business owners they want to get things so quick they want it now they want it now but I was playing baseball from five years old until the chance of potentially playing professional when it happened until I was 20 mm. it was 15 years of practicing every day to potentially get there yeah and I think I need to always think back and go back to that and say you know what it takes time you know, to grow anything. You know, the reality, I've been doing this business, baseball business, for 10 years. Yeah. So I, I, I think that's the biggest thing that's led me is every day, it's about the journey. You know, you got to think about it. It's about the root. It's everything you put into it. It's not just the fruits of the labor. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the key that I think about and I think every entrepreneur should think about. Mm. Um, how have you approached failure in life? <laughs> you know, being in a baseball team who tries crazy promotions like giving away <laughs> colon cleansings and Porta Johns, um, we're used to failure. So, you know, I think I think failure is it's very cliche to say you need to fail and you need to fail fast. You know, failure sucks. Mm -hmm. No one likes failure. Um, but the reality is you have to be okay with it and understand that when you're failing, you're trying things and you're actually achieving things. So the reality is if you're not failing, you're not trying enough. Mm -hmm. And I think so many people, they just constantly get used to just playing it safe yeah. and doing the normal things that they don't fail enough. So I'm not going to encourage people to fail. Failing's terrible. Yeah. But I'll tell you, if you look back in the last year and you haven't done anything that didn't go right or didn't go wrong, you probably haven't tried enough new things. Mm -hmm. You know, I, a great thing I heard from Will Farrell in, in, his, in his commencement speech the other day was that you got to keep throwing darts at the dartboard. You'll eventually hit the bullseye. Yeah. And, and he told many stories about the things that he failed with until he finally got those great opportunities in the movies. Mm -hmm. So uh, failure is something that you need to be able to embrace and be able to handle and understand that if you're not failing, you're not trying hard enough. Um, who influenced you early in life and who's your mentor now? And that will never change. It's my father, 100%. You know, people always ask, you know, what's the best advice you've ever received? And I can't answer that with a simple quote. My father is literally the most positive person I've ever met. You know, he gave me all these, these so he said, Jesse, you know, work hard, everything will work out for yourself. You know, swing hard in case you hit it when I played baseball. He <laughs> yeah. gave me all these great quotes. But I'll never forget when my dad went through cancer. He had two forms of cancer. Mm. And I'll never forget the pain that he went through and the challenge that he had to get surgeries, everything. And every day I would call him or see him. He would say, I said, dad, how you doing? He goes, Jesse, I'm great. I'm great. Yeah. And every day he said, great every single day. Yeah. And within six months, the cancer was gone. Wow. And I'll tell you one of those things you can say all the positivity changes everything. Mm -hmm. And he had this mindset. He goes, it's going to be a short term pain, but I'm going to be great. And he said it every single day. Mm. So my dad influences me. I call him every single day, still today. Yeah. And he just lifts me up. And I think the positivity uh, and optimism for life, there's nothing stronger. Mm. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, fa fatherhood is, uh, I'm trying to be that for my son. Uh, do, you, do you have kids? No, I don't. How old is your son? Uh, five. Okay. Yeah, just turned five. I'm trying to be that for my son. So I, I, I feel it. I can feel it. I can feel it. I feel the energy. Love it. So it's Love good. It. Uh, advice for new entrepreneurs. It's a great question. And you know, it's interesting because I feel like a new entrepreneur launching Find Your Yell Tux, the podcast, launching the book coming out. Just start. Mm -hmm. Just start. Here's the reality, which not many people don't know. I've written blogs for over a year. I've written 159 blogs. Mm. I've recorded myself. I've done, but I was too scared. I was afraid. This is the guy in a really? yellow tuxedo yeah. <laughs> that gets in front of 4,000 people. Yeah. But I was afraid to throw myself out there because everyone knew me as this guy that entertains and has fun. But throw myself out there and, you know, more of a serious also way of looking at life. Say, mm -hmm. you know what? You got to stand out. You, this, these are the realities of entrepreneurship. I was scared. It wasn't until a few weeks ago that I started putting stuff out every day. Mm -hmm. And so as an entrepreneur, just start. Get out there. You know what? You might pivot. You might change. You might try new things. But get out there. What's the worst that can happen? People don't care. They don't notice. You'll yeah. move on. Yeah. 
They'll forget. 100%. Nine times out of ten, people aren't looking at you anyway. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so you got that right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's a great point. I think yeah. so many people think it's always about them. Mm-hmm. Everyone's in their own bubble. Yep. You know, they're thinking about what they got to do that given day, what they got to do at the end of the day. It's, it's about them anyways. Yep. So you think like, oh, wow, what are they going to think? What are they going to think about me? No. What do you think about yourself? Yeah. You know, do you feel pride in what you're doing? Are you loving what you're doing? Because if you're not, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Uh, tell me a story about a failure. <laughs> I mean, the, the biggest failure that I think people know about here in Savannah was, it was, you know, less than two years ago. And, you know, we came down here to launch the Savannah team. We mm-hmm. were all excited, everything ready to rock and roll. We had this new ticket idea where we're giving everything away, all the food, all you can eat. We're going to be all about the circus. And Savannah didn't notice at first. And people mm-hmm. don't realize this. They're like, well, what an overnight success. The first six months, we literally didn't bring in any sales. Mm. It got so bad that I'll never forget literally being at my best friend's wedding up in New Jersey. And we got a phone call that said, Jesse, we completely overdrafted our account. There's no money left in our account. Oh, man. And so my wife and I were just married for a few months at this point. We just come down to Savannah. And my wife, amazing, she just says, we have no other option. We have to sell our house. And so our house in Charlotte with our team up in Gastonia, Mm -hmm. she said, we need to sell our house. So we sold it. We emptied out our savings account, put the money into the team. We found a, a, a duplex here that was on the market for over two years just so we could get down here. And it was that moment that I realized it's like, wow, this may fail. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we saw the success in Gastonia, but this may fail. But it was that moment that we believed so much that we had to go all in. And if you looked at us right there back in January of 2016, you'd say, they are failures. Mm-hmm. They came in, we had employees here that, that put everything into us, believing that we can make it successful. And we had failed. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until the bananas and the excitement and all the energy that people finally saw what we were doing, that the success came out of that. Mm. But Mm. to have to sell your house and empty out your savings account and not know if it's going to work or not, uh, that was a pretty tough failure to deal with. Luckily, we were able to turn it around. Yeah. So what what advice would you give to an entrepreneur that's going to be in your shoes uh, in a similar situation? And I talk about this a lot in the book. I said, you got to be able to try small bets for a while small bets and find out is can it be successful and do you really believe in it the small bets aren't just to find out if something's going to work it's finding out do you believe in what you're doing mm. for us for 10 years in Gastonia, we were trying new things and all of a sudden we found out you know what we believe in this we believe people need more fun in their life we believe they need entertainment this can work mm-hmm. and so we believe so much that we knew if we just got through this challenge in savannah that it, it would work that all of a sudden come up with the bananas that we would have success mm-hmm. so for an entrepreneur try things out and do you believe in it? Are you able to deal with it when you don't get that immediate res- result? You know, everyone, mm-hmm. wants, everyone wants progress and recognition. But if you're not having progress and not having recognition, do you still care about it? Mm-hmm. I think that's the key. So, um, like, how, why do you think you're different? Right? <laughs> right? Because, uh, I'm serious, like, because uh, most people, my wife wouldn't let me sell a house for a business. Right? So, like, well, she came, my wife came up with that's it. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> like, you and your wife, your yeah. wife's name is Emily, correct? Yes, correct. Yeah, so you and, you and Emily, like, what's, what's different about you guys? I think that's a question everyone needs to ask. What makes you different? Yeah. Um, you know, for me, if you ask people, and I think this is a great question, you know, you got to get real with some of your best friends and your family and say, you know, what, what is it about me? And sit down. What is it? You know, I think if you ask people about me, I think they know that I am going to be real crazy, fun, and outgoing. That's me. And I'm going to do that. So I, that's my personality. And if I find something that fits my personality, that's how you be, that's how you're successful. So I think, you know, you can't just say everyone, how do you sell the house? How do you do, how do you go all in on it? But people knew I was doing something that I was, I'm passionate about. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's very easy to cliche to say passion, passion, passion. You know, you got to be passionate about something, but it's very easy to see. Are you passionate about it? You right. know, I mean, right now you see the tone of my voice, my energy. Mm-hmm. All right. I am so passionate about this that it's not going to stop me. Mm-hmm. You know, we have an amazing videographer who's right here with us yeah. right now. Yeah. He is unbelievable at producing videos and also producing music. He's mm. passionate about it. He works harder than anyone I've ever seen. He'll put out videos nonstop. And it's those types of things that you know that it works out well. Awesome. Uh, what motivates you? You love me. I'm pausing now. <laughs> <laughs> I think the hack answer, the easy answer is to say, to make a difference, to make an impact. Um, I think about this question all the time and I think everyone should it's how will you be remembered Mm -hmm. and and I ask that question in my podcast and as morbid it sounds I I go and think about that I think about you know if I were to die today what would the eulogy say Mm -hmm. and that's a tough thing to think about but what motivates me is what that says about me and the difference and the impact I made 
did I actually help people? Did I connect people? Did I make their lives better? And if people focus solely about themselves, they're not going to be able to accomplish that. You need to start changing the way you focus and focus on others. Mm. And so what motivates me is is reality, is that answer. It's to make an impact and difference in people's life to really make their life better. And as I say, stand out and live the life of their dreams and be the best version of themselves. Mm -hmm. That's what's motivating me right now. Mm. I agree with that. And that's not morbid at all. <laughs> I mean, because uh, you, you have to kind of get comfortable with death, mm -hmm. you know, if you're going to really change. Like, that's the, that's the only time you see somebody actually change is when they go have a sickness or when they have, like, uh, they get diabetes or I almost had pre-diabetes at yeah. one point. Like, they get or, you know what I'm saying, cancer, AIDS, HIV, like anything. That's and, when they change. And then how much know? do they accomplish? Here's the real thing. Yeah. And so, it, say they're going to sick, they have six months to live. How much do they get done in those six months? Oh, man, yeah, they live the life of their amount. dreams in six months, and yeah. they do everything they should do. So why doesn't everyone live like that? Right. Because we think we're living on infinite time. Mm -hmm. But if you change the way you look, you're going to do things differently. You're not going to pay attention to things about the way other people think. You're going to do what you believe is best. Yep. So I, I think everyone should think about that as morbid as it sounds. Yep. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's true. Uh, what's one thing in your business that drains you of energy, and what's one thing that excites you? Oh, that's easy. Uh, drains me energy, firefighting. So, and I think everyone does this. They put out fires, things they have to deal with in a given day, things that come up you weren't expecting. So for me, that drains me of energy is doing things I'm terrible at. So what I'm terrible at, like I said, is anything operational. Anything, mm -hmm. anything that has to like this execution of operational. What brings me energy and excitement yeah. is creating. Mm -hmm. So in a given day, if we're talking about creating videos or creating something new to put out there, I get fired up. I get mm -hmm. fired up. So I try to think of every day, how can I create, work with our people to create new things? Mm. What do I hate? If, if yeah, all of a sudden you put me, Jesse, we need you uh, carrying things around the stadium, setting things up around the ballpark. I'm terrible at it and it <laughs> drains me. And I'm like, what am I doing? So I try to stay away from that. That's right. why the staff even calls me Jesse Ops once in a while to joke around because they know I'm <laughs> terrible at Ops. <laughs> uh, What's something that you consume religiously? Could be a blog, TV show, YouTube channel, food, podcast. Uh, reading. I, I'm obsessed. I mean, I, I read about uh, two books a week. Okay. And, and uh, my wife jokes around. She's like, Jesse, you have bookmarks in 11 books right now. Can't you just... And, and so that's my ADD culture. It's like, ooh, I'm liking this, but ooh, this is it's like the shiny new object that I keep moving on. Uh, you know, I think it's very important how everyone starts their day. Mm -hmm. You know, most people, I believe, they start their day, they look at their phone, they see what the social media, they look at emails, they constantly, they're influenced by other people. They don't mm. start their day on purpose. Mm -hmm. So I keep my phone out of my bedroom. I start my day, I get up and I start, I read. I read a chapter or two, then I run, then I write. And that's what I do every single day. Mm. And so when you start your day, you're, you're accomplished. You feel like you've achieved something mm -hmm. and you're doing it for you. You're not responding to other people. Mm. So that's something I do religiously is my mornings with reading, writing, and running. Okay, here's, here's another question offshoot. Like, do you when you start a book, do you have to finish it or do you stop? If you, a great question. You, you know, yeah, that's it. great. If you can't get into it within the first 20 pages, stop reading. Mm. Because what it does, it takes away your love of reading. Mm -hmm. If you ever feel like you, it's the same thing in life. If yeah. you feel like you have to force yourself to get through something, like st st you know, you're stuck in traffic. And it's yeah. like, oh, I got to keep doing this every single day. Well, maybe it's a sign to get out. Mm. And the same thing with a book. I mean, how many people now with a TV or movie they'll watch, they, they turn it off. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't have time for that. That's true. Yeah. That's true. Um, What's something most people don't know about you? Whew. Don't know about me. Well, they probably could figure out. Um, I am an only child. Um, <laughs> I have constantly been trying to fight for uh, the affection and attention from my dad. So constantly, <laughs> as you could see. So uh, even today, you know, even today, one of the biggest things I try to find out is how to make my dad proud. So every day I'm trying to do that. And it's crazy. You know, you think about, you know, if you have fortunate to have success and accomplish, you know, you're, you're, you feel content with that. Mm -hmm. But every day I want to call, dad, you won't believe what happened. You know, <laughs> we, we sold out another game, you know, whatever. And, and it's, it's interesting, but I, I think everyone has that to an extent. Of course. Yeah, yeah. of course. Um, what's the last experience that made you a stronger person? <laughs> last experience that made me a stronger person. Whew. Um, that's a tough one right there. See, this, it, most people probably just jump into something, and that's what I'm worried about <laughs> jumping into right now. I, I, I think I think what's making me stronger every day is uh, in our office. It's working with our people. I care so much about our people here in mm -hmm. the office, and they're all young. They're all right out of college. They've been here for a couple of years. I think what's making me stronger is how to you know, make them feel every day like they're making a difference. Mm -hmm. And it's interacting with people. I think people struggle communication now. It's constantly text messages. It's constantly, you know, we have Slack and email. Mm -hmm. It's constantly doing all that. So I think being able to connect with our people is a challenge every day that I'm trying to work on. Mm. Yeah. 
Um, what's something you learned the last week? <laughs> something I learned the last week. All right, I, I think this is a, a great book that I think everyone should read. I've been blown away by the book Friction um, mm -hmm. by Jeff Rosenblum. Okay. And what he talks about is about creating passion brands. And he said so many businesses, what they focus on is just putting themselves out there, throwing out their marketing, but they don't work on how do you really connect with the people. And it gives a great example of Yeti. You know, Yeti, you know, they're coolers. They're, you know, they're, <laughs> it's, it's, but what happens is they are such a passion brand. If you watch their videos, which are unbelievable on YouTube, mm -hmm. they are about these, this way of living life. And it's, they show these unbelievable scenes of people out in the wilderness and kayaking and, and taking on the world. And then they may have one little Yeti hat on it. They don't even, it's not about them. Right. It's about the people. So what I've learned more than anything, it's about how do you create a passion brand of what you're trying to do? And it's not about what you're selling, but it's about the life that you're creating. And if, if you can try to create a great life with your business that people feel it and they, they embody it, then you're being truly successful. That's something I learned. Uh, what's a tool, uh, like an app website or physical tool that you couldn't run your business without? Ooh, tool couldn't run the business without. <laughs> well, the easy, the easy answer is all. I couldn't run it out without phones or email. But, um, you know, what's, what's been interesting, a tool that we, we could run without, but it's been great, is, is Slack. And I'll give that okay. a, a, new, a new tool. Um, again, I go back to communication. And we constantly are communicating there. And I think so many businesses aren't. You know, we share fun things. We keep the culture by communicating. So, mm -hmm. yes, could we live without it? Yes, we didn't have it a year ago. But I want <laughs> right. to give something new for the listeners. And I would say, how can you communicate in a fun way at different channels constantly? Mm -hmm. And I think that's key. Awesome. Uh, so there's a concept called the 80-20 principle, Pareto's principle. Yep, 100%. 20% of your actions equal 80% of your results. What are the 20% of actions you take that get you 80% of the results? I love it. Uh, that's a great question. And, you know, I never broken it down like that. But the reality is I know when we – all right, you're going to get me going here. I like this. <laughs> I like this. You're going to get me going. <laughs> So, so for me, the 20% of my actions and how I start my day is I try to get, I try to get everything done by nine in the morning, mm. literally everything done, every post, every social media thing. If you look at the bananas, you look at me, everything's done before nine. So what I do is I try to get everything that can be out and let the world respond to it the rest of the day so that I can focus on whatever else happens in the day. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people, they think about, I'm going to put things out later. No, get your things out that are most important and then let the world react to that. So mm -hmm. for instance, I try to get my emails done before nine o'clock. I try to get everything done and send it out and then let the world come back and respond. So that is a little bit of a, not a full answer, but I would say the earlier you can get the most important things done to send out to people, to put out in the world, you win. Mm. Uh, a few more. Uh, do, you <laughs> okay. do you feel that your business is your life's calling? 100%. 100%. I, I could keep going, but I know that every day we're making a difference. We're making an impact and people are having fun. And I think that's that's really cool. I mean, I love when we put out something on social media and people start saying, I love you guys. That's so much fun. I mean, that's awesome. We know yeah. we're having fun. So I, I'm sure I'll find other things that are life's calling, but yeah. this is exactly where I want to be right now. Uh, is there a quote that has always been a mantra that you live by? <laughs> well, you heard one earlier. You know, whatever is normal, do the exact opposite. Yeah. But, uh, you know, the, the quotes that I always reference, and I have them here with my my uh, three mentors, which are all dead, but Walt, <laughs> Walt Disney, Bill Vec, and P.T. Barnum. And, you know, Walt Disney, I created these, and it's vision. Okay. It's kind of fun to do The Impossible by Walt Disney. Bill Vec is one of the most famous baseball owners that no one knows of, mm -hmm. um, but I try not to break the rules, but merely test their elasticity. Mm. And then P.T. Barnum, you got to love P.T., showmanship, and without promotion, something terrible happens. Nothing. Mm. And those three have guided me kind of in how we look at the business, but almost every speech that I make, when I'm going out and speaking in the community or, or fortunate to speak around the country, I always finish from Walt Disney saying, you know, all of our dreams can come true if we have the courage to pursue them. Mm. And I, I believe that more than anything. I think people need to get out there and try things and, and just get crazy and get fun. And, mm -hmm. I, and I think that's what's really motivated me. Mm. Uh, I asked you this a little bit earlier, but you probably want the sound bite. So if you could live anywhere in the world, where would it be? If I could live anywhere in the world, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, that, that, that's tough because we have two teams and two markets. All right. You got to put Maybe me, not. Maybe you're going to put me in a tough spot. Uh, no, <laughs> no, no, no. 
obviously Savannah right now, we yeah. absolutely love Savannah because of the character, the fun, the creative personality of this town. Uh, we love it and we feed off it. Um, but you know, I'll, I'll stay right there with Savannah, even though I'll tell you right now, we do love Gastonia. We love what we're doing. Of course, so yeah. Charlotte's there. a well. beautiful city. Yes, it is. hundred percent. Uh, two more. All right. If you had a superpower or ability, what would you choose and why? <laughs> you know, I asked that question too. You know, okay. all the questions that I asked my podcast, I should try to figure out what my answer would be. Cause I don't know if I even have an answer for the super, super power um that i I, I have an answer but go ahead you probably do um you know you i used to i used to always think i wish i could know what people think but you know what no no you don't don't want to know what people think no that's terrible as i say it's not about what people think it's what you're doing so um the superpower actually go give me yours uh to live forever live forever yeah don't you be tired no, no. <laughs> sooner or later you get over it. You, you know, you try to kill yourself a couple of times, but you just wait back. You get over it. You know. Uh, I hear you. I hear but you. I would love to be able to um, pass down knowledge to my great grandchildren. Yeah. My, you know, the entire family tree. I would love to be able to pass down that knowledge. Yeah, I love that. That that's that's why I would live. Family. I love that. I love it. I didn't. I didn't have a grandfather or yeah. great grandfather. You know, so I would yeah. love to be able to. I, you know, I might go the other way, and I think one of my guests answered this too. But the idea of um, being able to time travel. Mm. Um, you know, not just before because I'd love to meet some of the greats from back. I mean, obviously my three mentors, I'd love to spend time with them, right. but go forward. I want to meet some of the big innovators mm-hmm. in the 2100s. You yeah. know, I want to meet some of that, you know, the knowledge. So I think to be able to time travel would be really interesting. That's a good one. Yeah. That's a good one too. Okay. Last one. Uh, advice for entrepreneurial kids and their parents. Kids. Yes. Love it. Um, I, I, I'm going to stay with this again, you know, for, for a kid, you know, be you have fun man as a kid whatever you you enjoy the most whatever you're the best at it just pursue it don't care about what everyone else is thinking don't care about what other people are doing just do you and enjoy it my man amazing i thank you jesse it was a great interview thank you thanks man appreciate (laughs) it i enjoyed it um so once again how can people find you how can people get in touch with you uh yes uh facebook i'm always on facebook uh jesse cole the yellow tux guy i'm probably the only person you'll find with the yellow tux on facebook so uh look me up there uh or find your yellow tux.com all right thank you jesse for being on the show everyone out there listening thank you for tuning in uh as always go out there and be the change you want to see in the world do something impactful help somebody close to you and just do something take action this week Do something that you want to do that you love and be there for somebody uh, that loves you. So thank you guys for listening and I'll talk to you next time. Bye.